Disc 4. The premises of Fullerton, Harrison and Ledbetter were typical of an old-fashioned firm of the utmost respectability. The hand of time had made itself felt. There were no more Harrisons and no more Ledbetters. There was a Mr. Atkinson and a young Mr. Cole, and there was still Mr. Jeremy Fullerton, senior partner. A lean, elderly man, Mr. Fullerton, with an impassive face, a dry, legal voice, and eyes that were unexpectedly shrewd. Beneath his hand rested a sheet of notepaper, the few words on which he had just read. He read them once again, assessing their meaning very exactly. Then he looked at the man whom the note introduced to him. Monsieur Hercule Poirot? He made his own assessment of the visitor. An elderly man, a foreigner, very dapper in his dress, unsuitably attired as to the feet in patent leather shoes, which were, so Mr. Fullerton guessed shrewdly, too tight for him. Faint lines of pain were already etching themselves round the corners of his eyes. A dandy, a fop, a foreigner, and recommended to him by, of all people, Inspector Henry Raglan, C.I.D., and also vouched for by Superintendent Spence, retired, formerly of Scotland Yard. "'Superintendent Spence, eh?' said Mr. Fullerton. Fullerton knew Spence. A man who had done good work in his time had been highly thought of by his superiors. Faint memories flashed across his mind. Rather a celebrated case, more celebrated actually than it had shown any signs of being, a case that had actually seemed cut and dried. Of course. It came to him that his nephew Robert had been connected with it, had been junior counsel. A psychopathic killer, it had seemed, a man who had hardly bothered to try and defend himself, a man whom you might have thought really wanted to be hanged, because it had meant hanging at that time. No fifteen years or indefinite number of years in prison. No, you paid the full penalty. And more's the pity they've given it up, so Mr. Fullerton thought in his dry mind. The young thugs nowadays thought they didn't risk much by prolonging assault to the point where it became mortal. Once your man was dead, there'd be no witness to identify you. Spence had been in charge of the case, a quiet, dogged man, who had insisted all along that they'd got the wrong man. And they had got the wrong man. And the person who found the evidence that they'd got the wrong man was some sort of amateurish foreigner, some retired detective chap from the Belgian police force. A good age then. And now, senile probably, thought Mr. Fullerton, but all the same, he himself would take the prudent course. Information. That was what was wanted from him. Information, which, after all, could not be a mistake to give, since he could not see that he was likely to have any information that could be useful in this particular matter, a case of child homicide. Mr. Fullerton might think he had a fairly shrewd idea of who had committed that homicide, but he was not so sure as he would like to be, because there were at least three claimants in the matter. Any one of three young ne'er-do-wells might have done it. Words floated through his head. Mentally retarded. Psychiatrist's report. That's how the whole matter would end, no doubt. All the same, to drown a child at a party. That was rather a different cup of tea from one of the innumerable schoolchildren who did not arrive home and who had accepted a lift in a car after having been repeatedly warned not to do so, and who had been found in a nearby copse or gravel pit. A gravel pit now. When was that? Many, many years ago. All this took about four minutes' time, and Mr. Fullerton then cleared his throat in a slightly asthmatic fashion and spoke. Oh, "'Monsieur Hercule Poirot,' he said again, "'what can I do for you? I suppose it's the business of this young girl, Joyce Reynolds. Nasty business, uh, very nasty business. I can't see, actually, where I can assist you. I know very little about it all.' "'But you are, I believe, the legal adviser to the Drake family.' "'Oh, yes, yes, Hugo Drake, poor chap. Very nice fellow. I've known them for years.' Ever since they bought apple trees and came here to live. Sad thing, Polio. He contracted it when they were holidaying abroad one year. Mentally, of course, his health was quite unimpaired. It's sad when it happens to a man who has been a good athlete all his life. A sportsman. Good at games and all the rest of it. Yes, sad business to know you're a cripple for life. You were also, I believe, in charge of the legal affairs of Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe. Uh, the aunt, yes. A remarkable woman, really. She came here to live after her health broke down, so as to be near her nephew and his wife. Bought that white elephant of a place, Quarry House. Paid far more than it was worth. But money was no object to her. She was very well off. She could have found a more attractive house, but it was the quarry itself that fascinated her. Got a landscape gardener onto it. 
Fellow quite high up in his profession, I believe. One of those handsome, long-haired chaps. But he had ability, all right. He did well for himself in this quarry garden work. Got himself quite a reputation over it. Illustrated in homes and gardens and all the rest of it. Yes, Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe knew how to pick people. It wasn't just a question of a handsome young man as a protégé. Some elderly women are foolish that way, but this chap had brains and was at the top of his profession. Uh, but I'm uh, wandering on a bit. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe died nearly two years ago. Quite suddenly. Fullerton looked at Poirot sharply. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. She had a heart condition, and doctors tried to keep her from doing too much, but she was the sort of woman that you couldn't dictate to. She wasn't a hypochondriac type, he coughed and said, but I expect we're getting away from the subject about which you came to talk to me. Well, not really, said Poirot, although I would like, if I may, to ask you a few questions on a completely different matter. Some information about one of your employees, by name Leslie Ferrier? Mr. Fullerton looked somewhat surprised. Leslie Ferrier, he said. Leslie Ferrier, let me see. Really, you know, I, I'd nearly forgotten his name, yes. Yes, of course, uh, got himself knifed, didn't he? That is the man I mean. Well, I don't know really that I can tell you much about him. It took place some years ago. Knifed near the Green Swan one night. No arrest was ever made. I dare say the police had some idea who was responsible, but it was mainly, I think, a matter of getting evidence. The motive was emotional? inquired Poirot. Oh, yes, I should think, certainly so. Uh, jealousy, you know. He'd been going steady with a married woman. Her husband had a pub. Uh, the Green Swan at Woodley Common. Uh, unpretentious place. Uh, then, it seems, young Leslie started playing around with another young woman. Uh, or more than one, it was said. Quite a one for the girls, he was. Uh, there was a bit of trouble once or twice. You were satisfied with him as an employee? I would rather describe it as not dissatisfied. <laughs> he had his points. Uh, he handled clients well and was studying for his articles, and if only he'd paid more attention to his position and keeping up a good standard of behaviour, it would have been better, instead of mixing himself up with one girl after another, uh, most of whom I am apt in my old-fashioned way to consider as considerably beneath him in station. Uh, there was a row one night— at the Green Swan, and Leslie Ferrier was knifed on his way home. Was one of the girls responsible, or would it be Mrs. Green Swan, do you think? Really, it is not a case of knowing anything definite. I believe the police considered it was a case of jealousy, but— uh, He shrugged his shoulders. But you are not sure. Oh, it happens, said Mr. Fullerton. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. <laughs> that is always being quoted in court. Sometimes it's true. But I think I discern that you yourself are not at all sure that this was the case here. Well, I, I should have preferred rather more evidence, shall we say. The police would have preferred rather more evidence, too. Public prosecutor threw it out, I believe. It could have been something quite different? Oh, yes. One could propound several theories. Uh, not a very stable character, young Ferrier. Uh, well brought up. Nice mother. A widow. A father not so satisfactory. He got himself out of several scrapes by the skin of his teeth. Hard luck on his wife. Our young man in some ways resembled his father. He was associated once or twice with a rather doubtful crowd. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. He was still young. But I warned him that he was getting himself mixed up with the wrong lot, too closely connected with fiddling transactions outside the law. Frankly, but for his mother, I wouldn't have kept him. He was young, and he had ability. I— I gave him a warning or two, which I hoped might do the trick. But there's a lot of corruption about these days. It's been on the increase for the last ten years. Someone might have had it in for him, you think? Oh, quite possible. These associations of uh, gangs is a rather melodramatic word, but you run a certain danger when you get tangled up with them. Any idea that you may split on them, <laughs> and a knife between your shoulder blades, isn't an uncommon thing to happen.
And nobody saw it happen? No, uh, nobody saw it happen. They wouldn't, of course. Whoever took the job on would have all the arrangements nicely made, alibi at the proper place and time, and so on and so on. Yet somebody might have seen it happen, somebody quite unlikely. A child, for instance? Late at night, in the neighbourhood of the Green Swan? Hardly a very credible idea, Monsieur Poirot. A child, persisted Poirot, who might remember. A child coming home from a friend's house, at some short distance, perhaps, from her own home? She might have been coming by a footpath, or seen something from behind a hedge. Oh, really, Monsieur Poirot, what an imagination you have got! What you are saying seems to me most unlikely. It does not seem so unlikely to me, said Poirot. Children do see things. They are so often, you see, not expected to be where they are. But surely, when they go home and relate what they have seen, they might not, said Poirot. They might not, you see, be sure of what they had seen, especially if what they had seen had been fairly frightening to them. Children do not always go home and report a street accident they have seen, or some unexpected violence. Children keep their secrets very well, keep them and think about them. Sometimes they like to feel that they know a secret, a secret which they are keeping to themselves. Well, they'd tell their mothers, said Mr. Fullerton. I am not so sure of that, said Poirot. In my experience, the things that children do not tell their mothers are quite numerous. What interests you so much, may I know, about this case of Leslie Ferrier? Uh, the regrettable death of a young man by a violence which is so lamentably often amongst us nowadays? I know nothing about him, but I wanted to know something about him, because his is a violent death that occurred not many years ago. That might be important to me. You know, Monsieur Poirot, said Mr. Fullerton, with some slight acerbity, I really cannot quite make out why you have come to me, and in what you are really interested. You cannot surely suspect any tie-up between the death of Joyce Reynolds and the death of a young man of promise but slightly criminal activities who has been dead for some years. One can suspect anything, said Poirot. One has to find out more. Excuse me. What one has to have in all matters in dealing with crime is evidence. You have perhaps heard that the dead girl Joyce was heard by several witnesses to say that she had with her own eyes witnessed a murder. In a place like this, said Mr. Fullerton, one usually hears any rumour that may be going round. One usually hears it, too, if I may add these words, in a singularly exaggerated form, not usually worthy of credence. That also, said Poirot, is quite true. Joyce was, I gather, just thirteen years of age. A child of nine could remember something she had seen, a hit-and-run accident, a fight or a struggle with knives on a dark evening, or a schoolteacher who was strangled, say. All these things might leave a very strong impression on a child's mind about which she would not speak being uncertain, perhaps, of the actual facts she had seen, and mulling them over in her own mind, forgetting about them even, possibly until something happened to remind her. You agree that that is a possible happening? Oh, yes, yes, but I hardly... Uh, I think it is an extremely far-fetched supposition. You had also, I believe, a disappearance here of a foreign girl. Her name, I believe, was Olga, or Sonia, I am not sure of the surname. Olga Semenov. Yes, indeed. Not, I fear, a very reliable character? No. She was companion or nurse attendant to Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe, was she not, whom you described to me just now, uh, Mrs. Drake's aunt. Yes, she had had several girls in that position, two other foreign girls, I think, one of them with whom she quarrelled almost immediately, and another one who was nice but painfully stupid. A Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe was not one to suffer fools gladly. Olga, her last venture, seems to have suited her very well. She was not, if I remember rightly, a particularly attractive girl, said Mr. Fullerton. She was short, rather stocky, uh, had rather a dour manner, and people in the neighbourhood did not like her very much. But Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe did like her, suggested Poirot. She became very much attached to her. Unwisely so, it seemed, at one moment. Ah, indeed. I have no doubt, said Mr. Fullerton, that I am not telling you anything that you have not heard already. These things, as I say, go round the place like wildfire. 
I understand that Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe left a large sum of money to the girl. A most surprising thing to happen, said Mr. Fullerton. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe had not changed her fundamental testamentary disposition for many years, except for adding new charities or altering legacies left void by death. Perhaps I am telling you what you know already, if you are interested in this matter. Her money had always been left jointly to her nephew, Hugo Drake, and his wife, who was also his first cousin, and so also niece to Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe. If either of them predeceased her, the money went to the survivor. A good many bequests were left to charities and to old servants. But what was alleged to be her final disposal of her property was made about three weeks before her death, and not, as heretofore, drawn up by our firm. It was a codicil written in her own handwriting. It included one or two charities, and not so many as before. The old servants had no legacies at all, and the whole residue of her considerable fortune was left to Olga Semenov, in gratitude for the devoted service and affection she had shown her. A most astonishing disposition, one that seemed totally unlike anything Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe had ever done before. "'And then?' said Poirot. "'You have presumably heard more or less the developments. From the evidence of handwriting experts, it became clear that the codicil was a complete forgery. It bore only a faint resemblance to Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe's handwriting, no more than that. Mrs. Smythe had disliked the typewriter, and had frequently got Olga to write letters of a personal nature— as far as possible, copying her employer's handwriting, sometimes even signing the letter with her employer's signature. She had had plenty of practice in doing this. It seems that when Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe died, the girl went one step further, and thought that she was proficient enough to make the handwriting acceptable as that of her employer. But that sort of thing won't do with experts. No, indeed, it won't. Proceedings were about to be taken to contest the document. Quite so. There was, of course, the usual legal delay before the proceedings actually came to court. During that period, the young lady lost her nerve, and, well, uh, as you said yourself just now, she uh, disappeared. When Hercule Poirot had taken his leave and departed, Jeremy Fullerton sat before his desk, drumming gently with his fingertips. His eyes, however, were far away, lost in thought. He picked up a document in front of him and dropped his eyes down to it, but without focusing his glance. The discreet buzz of the house telephone caused him to pick up the receiver on his desk. "'Yes, Miss Miles?' "'Mr. Holden is here, sir.' "'Yes, yes, his appointment, I believe, was for nearly three-quarters of an hour ago.' Did he give any reason for having been so late? Yes, yes, quite, I see. Uh, rather the same excuse he gave last time. Will you tell him I've seen another client, and am now too short of time? Make an appointment with him for next week, will you? We can't have this sort of thing going on. Yes, Mr. Fullerton. He replaced the receiver, and sat looking thoughtfully down at the document in front of him. He was still not reading it. His mind was going over events of the past— two years. Close on two years ago. And that strange little man this morning, with his patent leather shoes and his big moustaches, had brought it back to him, asking all those questions. Now he was going over in his own mind a conversation of nearly two years ago. He saw again, sitting in the chair opposite him, a girl, a short, stocky figure, the olive-brown skin, the dark red, generous mouth, the heavy cheekbones and the fierceness of the blue eyes that looked into his beneath the heavy beetling brows. A passionate face. A face full of vitality, a face that had known suffering, would probably always know suffering, but would never learn to accept suffering. The kind of woman who would fight and protest until the end. Where was she now, he wondered. Somehow or other she had managed. What had she managed, exactly? Who had helped her? Had anyone helped her? Somebody must have done so. She was back again, he supposed, in some trouble-stricken spot in Central Europe, where she had come from, where she belonged, where she had had to go back to, because there was no other course for her to take, unless she was content to lose her liberty. Jeremy Fullerton was an upholder of the law. He believed in the law. He was contemptuous of many of the magistrates of today, with their weak sentences, their acceptance of scholastic needs— 
the students who stole books, the young married women who denuded the supermarkets, the girls who filched money from their employers, the boys who wrecked telephone boxes, none of them in real need, none of them desperate, most of them had known nothing but overindulgence in bringing up, and a fervent belief that anything they could not afford to buy was theirs to take. Yet along with his intrinsic belief in the administration of the law justly, Mr. Fullerton was a man who had compassion. He could be sorry for people. He could be sorry, and was sorry, for Olga Semenov, though he was quite unaffected by the passionate arguments she advanced for herself. I came to you for help. I thought you would help me. You were kind last year. You helped me with forms so that I could remain another year in England. So they say to me, You need not answer any questions you do not wish to. You can be represented by a lawyer. So, I come to you. But the circumstances you have instanced— and Mr. Fullerton remembered how dryly and coldly he had said that, all the more dryly and coldly because of the pity that lay behind the dryness of the statement. Do not apply. In this case I am not at liberty to act for you legally. I am representing already the Drake family. As you know, I was Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe's solicitor. But she is dead. She does not want a solicitor when she is dead. She was fond of you, said Mr. Fullerton. Yes, she was fond of me. That is what I am telling you. That is why she wanted to give me the money. All her money? Why not? Why not? She did not like her relations. You are wrong. She was very fond of her niece and nephew. Well, then, uh, she may have liked Mr. Drake, uh, but she did not like Mrs. Drake. She found her very tiresome. Mrs. Drake interfered. She would not let Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe do always what she liked. She would not let her eat the food she liked. She is a very conscientious woman, and she tried to get her aunt to obey the doctor's orders as to diet, and not too much exercise, and many other things. People do not always want to obey a doctor's orders. They do not want to be interfered with by relations. They like living their own lives and doing what they want and having what they want. She had plenty of money. She could have what she wanted. She could have as much as she liked of everything. She was rich, 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 and she could do what she liked with her money. They have already quite enough money, Mr. and Mrs. Drake. They have a fine house and clothes and two cars. They are very well to do. Why should they have any more? They were her only living relations. She wanted me to have the money. She was sorry for me. She knew what I had been through. She knew about my father, arrested by the police and taken away. We never saw him again, my mother and I. And then my mother and how she died. All my family died. It is terrible what I have endured. You do not know what it is like to live in a police state, as I have lived in it. No, no. You are on the side of the police. You are not on my side. No, Mr. Fullerton said. I am not on your side. I am very sorry for what has happened to you. But you've brought this trouble about yourself. That is not true. It is not true that I have done anything I should not do. What have I done? I was kind to her. I was nice to her. I brought her in lots of things that she was not supposed to eat, chocolates and butter. All the time, nothing but vegetable fats. She did not like vegetable fats. She wanted butter. She wanted lots of butter. It's not just a question of butter, said Mr. Fullerton. I looked after her. I was nice to her. And so she was grateful, and when she died, and I find that in her kindness and her affection she has left a signed paper leaving all her money to me, then those drakes come along and say I shall not have it. They say all sorts of things. They say I had a bad influence. And then they say worse things than that. Much worse. They say that I wrote the will myself. That is nonsense. She wrote it. She wrote it. And then she sent me out of the room. She got the cleaning woman and Jim the gardener. She said they had to sign the paper, not me because I was going to get the money. Why should not I have the money? Why should I not have some good luck in my life, some happiness? It seemed so wonderful, all the things I had planned to do when I knew about it. I have no doubt, yes, I have no doubt. Why shouldn't I have plans? Why should not I rejoice? I'm going to be happy and rich and have all the things I want. What did I do wrong? Nothing, nothing, I tell you, nothing. I have tried to explain to you said Mr. Fullerton. That is all lies. You say I tell lies. You say I wrote the paper myself. I did not write it myself. She wrote it. Nobody can say anything different. 
"'Certain people say a good many things,' said Mr. Fullerton. "'Now listen. Stop protesting and listen to me. "'It is true, is it not, that Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe, "'in the letters you wrote for her, "'often asked you to copy her handwriting as nearly as you could. "'That was because she had an old-fashioned idea "'that to write typewritten letters to people who are friends "'or with whom you have a personal acquaintance "'is an act of rudeness. "'That is a survival from Victorian days.' Nowadays, nobody cares whether they receive handwritten letters or typewritten ones, but to Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe that was discourtesy. You understand what I am saying? Yes, I understand. And so she asks me. She says, Now, Olga, she says, These four letters you will answer as I have told you that you have taken down in shorthand. But you will write them in handwriting, and you will make the handwriting as close to mine as possible. And she told me to practice writing her handwriting, to notice how she made her A's and her B's and her L's and all the different letters. So long as it is reasonably like my handwriting, she said, that will do, and then you can sign my name. But I do not want people to think that I am no longer able to write my own letters, although, as you know, the rheumatism in my wrist is getting worse and I find it more difficult. But I don't want my personal letters typewritten. You could have written them in your ordinary handwriting, said Mr. Fullerton, and put a note at the end saying, per secretary, or per initials, if you liked. She did not want me to do that. She wanted it to be thought that she wrote the letters herself. And that, Mr. Fullerton thought, could be true enough. It was very like Louise Llewellyn Smythe. She was always passionately resentful of the fact that she could no longer do the things that she used to do, that she could no longer walk far, or go up hills quickly, or perform certain actions with her hands, her right hand especially. She wanted to be able to say, I'm perfectly well, perfectly all right, and there's nothing I can't do if I set my mind to it. Yes, what Olga was telling him now was perfectly true, and because it was true, it was one of the reasons why the codicil appended to the last will, properly drawn out and signed by Louise Llewellyn Smythe, had been accepted at first, without suspicion. It was in his own office, Mr. Fullerton reflected, that suspicions had arisen, because both he and his younger partner knew Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe's handwriting very well. It was young Cole who had first said, "'You know, I really can't believe that Louise Llewellyn Smythe wrote that codicil. I know she had arthritis lately, but look at these specimens of her own writing that I've brought along from amongst her papers to show you. There's something wrong about that codicil.' Mr. Fullerton had agreed that there was something wrong about it. He had said they would take expert opinion on this handwriting question. The answer had been quite definite. Separate opinions had not varied. The handwriting of the codicil was definitely not that of Louise Llewellyn Smythe. If Olga had been less greedy, Mr. Fullerton thought, if she had been content to write a codicil beginning as this one had done, because of her great care and attention to me, and the affection and kindness she has shown me, I leave. That was how it had begun— and that was how it could have begun. And if it had gone on to specify a good round sum of money left to the devoted au pair girl, the relations might have considered it overdone, but they would have accepted it without questioning. But to cut out the relations altogether, including the nephew, who had been his aunt's residuary legatee in the last four wills she had made during a period of nearly twenty years to leave everything to the stranger Olga Semenov, that was not in Louise Llewellyn Smythe's character. In fact, a plea of undue influence could upset such a document anyway. No. She had been greedy, this hot, passionate child. Possibly Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe had told her that some money would be left to her because of her kindness, because of her attention, because of a fondness the old lady was beginning to feel for this girl who fulfilled all her whims, who did whatever she asked her. And that had opened up a vista for Olga. She would have everything. The old lady should leave everything to her and she would have all the money, all the money and the house and the clothes and the jewels, everything. A greedy girl. And now retribution had caught up with her. And Mr. Fullerton, against his will, against his legal instincts, and against a good deal more, felt sorry for her, very sorry for her. She had known suffering since she was a child, had known the rigours of a police state, had lost her parents, lost a brother and a sister, and known injustice and fear and it had developed in her a trait that she had no doubt been born with, but which she had never been able so far to indulge. It had developed a childish, passionate greed. "'Everyone is against me,' said Olga. "'Everyone! You are all against me! 
You are not fair because I am a foreigner, because I do not belong to this country, because I do not know what to say, what to do, what can I do? Why do you not tell me what I can do? Because I do not really think there is anything much you can do, said Mr. Fullerton. Your best chance is to make a clean breast of things. If I say what you want me to say, it will be all lies and not true. She made that will. She wrote it down there. She told me to go out of the room while the others signed it. There is evidence against you, you know. There are people who will say that Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe often did not know what she was signing. She had several documents of different kinds, and she did not always re-read what was put before her. Well, then, she did not know what she was saying. My dear child, said Mr. Fullerton, your best hope is the fact that you are a first offender, that you are a foreigner, that you understand the English language only in a rather rudimentary form. In that case, you may get off with a minor sentence, or you may indeed get put on probation. Oh, words! Nothing but words! I shall be put in prison and never let out again! Now you are talking nonsense, Mr. Fullerton said. It would be better if I ran away, if I ran away and hid myself so that nobody could find me. Once there is a warrant out for your arrest, you would be found. Not if I did it quickly, not if I went at once, not if someone helped me. I could get away, get away from England, in a boat or a plane. I could find someone who forges passports or visas or whatever you have to have. Someone who will do something for me. I have friends. I have people who are fond of me. Somebody could help me to disappear. That is what I need. I could put on a wig. I could walk about on crutches. Listen, Mr. Fullerton had said, and he had spoken then with authority. I am sorry for you. I will recommend you to a lawyer who will do his best for you. You can't hope to disappear. You are talking like a child. I've got enough money. I have saved money. And then she said, You have tried to be kind. Yes, I believe that. But you will not do anything, because it is all the law, the law. But someone will help me. Someone will. And I shall get away where nobody will find me. Nobody, Mr. Fullerton thought, had found her. He wondered. Yes, he wondered very much where she was or could be now. Admitted to apple trees, Hercule Poirot was shown into the drawing-room and told that Mrs. Drake would not be long. In passing through the hall he heard the hum of female voices, behind what he took to be the dining-room door. Poirot crossed to the drawing-room window and surveyed the neat and pleasant garden, well laid out, kept studiously in control. Rampant autumn Michaelmas daisies still survived, tied up severely to sticks. Chrysanthemums had not yet relinquished life. There was still a persistent rose or two scorning the approach of winter. Poirot could discern no sign as yet of the preliminary activities of a landscape gardener. All was care and convention. He wondered if Mrs. Drake had been one too many for Michael Garfield. He had spread his lures in vain. It showed every sign of remaining a splendidly kept suburban garden. The door opened. "'I am sorry to have kept you waiting, Monsieur Poirot,' said Mrs. Drake. Outside in the hall there was a diminishing hum of voices as various people took their leave and departed. "'It's our church Christmas fate,' explained Mrs. Drake. A committee meeting for arrangements for it, and all the rest of it. These things always go on much longer than they ought to, of course. Somebody always objects to something, or has a good idea. The good idea usually being a perfectly impossible one. There was a slight acerbity in her tone. Poirot could well imagine that Rowena Drake would put things down as quite absurd, firmly, and definitely. He could understand well enough from remarks he had heard from Spence's sister, from hints of what other people had said, and from various other sources, that Rowena Drake was that dominant type of personality whom everyone expects to run the show, and whom nobody has much affection for while she is doing it. He could imagine, too, that her conscientiousness had not been the kind to be appreciated by an elderly relative who was herself of the same type. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe, he gathered, had come here to live so as to be near to her nephew and his wife, and that the wife had readily undertaken the supervision and care of her husband's aunt as far as she could do so without actually living in the house. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe had probably acknowledged in her own mind that she owed a great deal to Rowena, 
and had at the same time resented what she had no doubt thought of as her bossy ways. "'Well, they've all gone now,' said Rowena Drake, hearing the final shutting of the hall door. "'Now, what can I do for you?' "'Something more about that dreadful party. I wish I'd never had it here. But no other house really seemed suitable. Is Mrs. Oliver still staying with Judith Butler?' "'Yes. She is, I believe, returning to London in a day or two. You had not met her before?' "'No. I love her books. She is, I believe, considered a very good writer,' said Poirot. "'Oh, well, she is a good writer, no doubt of that. She's a very amusing person, too. Has she any ideas herself, I mean, about who might have done this dreadful thing?' "'I think not. And you, madame? I've told you already, I have no idea whatever.' You would perhaps say so, and yet you might, might you not, have perhaps what amounts to a very good idea, but only an idea, a half-formed idea, a possible idea. Why should you think that? She looked at him curiously. You might have seen something, something quite small and unimportant, but which, on reflection, might seem more significant to you, perhaps, than it had done at first. You must have something in your mind, Monsieur Poirot, some definite incident. Well, I admit it. It is because of what someone said to me. Indeed. And who was that? A Miss Whittaker. A schoolteacher. Oh, yes, of course, Elizabeth Whittaker. She's the mathematics mistress, isn't she, at the Elms? She was at the party, I remember. Did she see something? It was not so much that she saw something, as she had the idea that you might have seen something. Mrs. Drake looked surprised and shook her head. I, I can't think of anything I could possibly have seen, said Rowena Drake. But uh, one never knows. It had to do with a vase, said Poirot, a vase of flowers. A vase of flowers? Rowena Drake looked puzzled. Then her brow cleared. Oh, of course I know, yes. There was a big vase of autumn leaves and chrysanthemums on the table in the angle of the stairs. A very nice glass vase. One of my wedding presents. The leaves seemed to be drooping, and so did one or two of the flowers. I remember noticing it as I passed through the hall. It was near the end of the party, I think, by then, uh, but I'm not sure. I wondered why it looked like that, and I went up and dipped my fingers into it and found that some idiot must have forgotten to put any water into it after arranging it. It made me very angry, so I took it into the bathroom and filled it up. But uh, what could I have seen in that bathroom? There was nobody in it, I'm quite sure of that. I think one or two of the older girls and boys had done a little harmless, what the Americans call necking, there during the course of the party, but there was certainly nobody when I went into it with the vase. No, no, I do not mean that, said Poirot, but I understand that there was an accident, that the vase slipped out of your hand and it fell to the hall below and was shattered to pieces. Oh, yes, said Rowena, broken to smithereens. I was rather upset about it, because, as I've said, it had been one of our wedding presents, and it was a really perfect flower vase, heavy enough to hold big autumn bouquets and things like that. It was very stupid of me. My fingers just slipped. It went out of my hand and crashed onto the hall floor below. Elizabeth Whittaker was standing there. She helped me pick up the pieces and sweep some of the broken glass out of the way in case someone stepped on it. We just swept it into a corner by the grandfather clock to be cleared up later. She looked inquiringly at Poirot. "'Is that the incident you mean?' she asked. "'Yes,' said Poirot. "'Miss Whittaker wondered, I think, how you had come to drop the vase. She thought that something perhaps had startled you? Startled me?' Rowena Drake looked at him, then frowned as she tried to think again. "'No, I, I don't think I was startled anyway. It was just one of those ways things do slip out of your hands. Sometimes when you're washing up—' I think, really, it's a result of being tired. I was pretty tired by that time, what with the preparations for the party and running the party and all the rest of it. It went very well, I must say. I think it was, oh, just one of those clumsy actions that you can't help when you're tired. There was nothing, you are sure, that startled you, something unexpected that you saw? Saw? Where? In the hall below? I didn't see anything in the hall below. It was empty at that moment, because everyone was at the snapdragon, except, of course, for Miss Whittaker, and I don't think I even noticed her until she came forward to help me when I ran down. Did you see someone perhaps leaving the library door? 
The library door. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, I could have seen that. She paused for quite a long time. Then she looked at Poirot with a very straight, firm glance. I didn't see anyone leaving the library, she said. Nobody at all. He wondered. The way in which she said it was what had aroused the belief in his mind that she was not speaking the truth, that instead she had seen someone or something, perhaps the door opening just a little, a mere glance perhaps of a figure inside. But she was quite firm in her denial. Why, he wondered, had she been so firm? Because the person she had seen was a person she did not want to believe for one moment had had anything to do with the crime committed on the other side of the door. Someone she cared about, or someone, which seemed more likely, he thought, someone whom she wished to protect. Someone, perhaps, who had not long passed beyond childhood. Someone whom she might feel was not truly conscious of the awful thing they had just done. He thought her a hard creature, but a person of integrity. He thought that she was like many women of the same type, women who were often magistrates, or who ran councils or charities, or interested themselves in what used to be called good works. Women who had an inordinate belief in extenuating circumstances, who were ready, strangely enough, to make excuses for the young criminal, an adolescent boy, a mentally retarded girl, someone perhaps who had already been, what is the phrase, in care. If that had been the type of person she had seen coming out of the library, then he thought it possible that Rowena Drake's protective instinct might have come into play. It was not unknown in the present age for children to commit crimes, quite young children, children of seven, of nine, and so on, and it was often difficult to know how to dispose of these natural, it seemed, young criminals who came before the juvenile courts. Excuses had to be brought for them. Broken homes, negligent and unsuitable parents, but the people who spoke the most vehemently for them, the people who sought to bring forth every excuse for them, were usually the type of Rowena Drake, a stern and censorious woman, except in such cases. For himself, Poirot did not agree. He was a man who thought first always of justice. He was suspicious, had always been suspicious, of mercy. Too much mercy, that is to say. Too much mercy, as he knew from former experience both in Belgium and in this country, often resulted in further crimes, which were fatal to innocent victims who need not have been victims if justice had been put first and mercy second. "'I see,' said Poirot. "'I see.' "'You don't think it's possible that Miss Whittaker might have seen someone go into the library?' suggested Mrs. Drake. Poirot was interested. "'Ah, you think that might have been so?' "'It seemed to me merely a possibility. She might have caught sight of someone going in through the library, say, perhaps five minutes or so earlier, and then, when I dropped the vase, it might have suggested to her that I could have caught a glimpse of the same person, that I might have seen who it was.' Perhaps she doesn't like to say anything that might suggest, unfairly perhaps, some person whom she had perhaps only half glimpsed, not enough to be sure of, some back view perhaps of a child or a young boy. You think, do you not, madame, that it was, shall we say, a child, a boy or girl, a mere child or a young adolescent? You think it was not any definite one of these, but shall we say you think that that is the most likely type to have committed the crime we are discussing? She considered the point thoughtfully, turning it over in her mind. Yes, she said at last, I suppose I do. I haven't thought it out. It seems to me that crimes are so often associated nowadays with the young, people who don't really know quite what they're doing, who want silly revenges, who have an instinct for destruction. Even the people who wreck telephone boxes or who slash the tires of cars do all sorts of things just to hurt people, just because they hate not anyone in particular, but the whole world. It's a sort of symptom of this age. So I suppose when one comes across something like a child, drowned at a party for no reason, really, one does assume that it's someone who is not yet fully responsible for their actions. Don't you agree with me that, uh, that, well, that that is certainly the most likely possibility here? The police, I think, share your point of view, or did share it. Well, they should know. 
We have a very good class of policemen in this district. They've done well in several crimes. They are painstaking, and they never give up. I think probably they will solve this murder, though I don't think it will happen very quickly. These things seem to take a long time, a long time of patient gathering of evidence. The evidence in this case will not be very easy to gather, madame. No, I suppose it won't. When my husband was killed, he was a cripple, you know. He was crossing the road, and a car ran over him and knocked him down. They never found the person who was responsible. As you know, my husband—or perhaps you don't know—my husband was a polio victim. He was partially paralyzed as a result of polio six years ago. His condition had improved, but he was still crippled, and it would be difficult for him to get out of the way if a car bore down upon him quickly. I almost felt that I had been to blame, though he always insisted on going out without me or without anyone with him, because he would have resented very much being in the care of a nurse or a wife who took the part of a nurse, and he was always careful before crossing a road. Still, one does blame oneself when accidents happen. That came on top of the death of your aunt. No, no, she died not long afterwards. Everything seems to come at once, doesn't it? That is very true," said Hercule Poirot. He went on. The police were not able to trace the car that ran down your husband. It was a grasshopper Mark Seven, I believe. Every third car you notice on the road is a grasshopper Mark Seven, or was then. It's the most popular car on the market. They tell me. They believe it was pinched from the marketplace in Medchester, a car park there. It belonged to a Mr. Waterhouse, an elderly seed merchant in Medchester. Mr. Waterhouse was a slow and careful driver. It was certainly not he who caused the accident. It was clearly one of those cases where irresponsible young men help themselves to cars. Such careless, or should I say, such callous young men should be treated. One sometimes feels more severely than they are now. A long jail sentence, perhaps, merely to be fined and the fine paid by indulgent relatives, makes little impression.、Oh, one has to remember," said Rowena Drake. That there are young people at an age when it is vital that they should continue with their studies if they are to have the chance of doing well in life. The sacred cow of education," said Hercule Poirot. "That is a phrase I have heard uttered," he added quickly, "by people, well, I should say, people who ought to know, people who themselves hold academic posts of some seniority." They do not perhaps make enough allowances for youth, for a bad bringing up, broken homes. So you think they need something other than jail sentences, proper remedial treatment," said Rowena Drake firmly. "And that will make、uh, another old-fashioned proverb a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You do not believe in the maxim: the fate of every man have we bound about his neck." Mrs. Drake looked extremely doubtful and slightly displeased. An Islamic saying, I believe," said Poirot. Mrs. Drake looked unimpressed. "I hope," she said, "we do not take our ideas, or perhaps I should say our ideals, from the Middle East." "One must accept facts," said Poirot, "and a fact that is expressed by modern biologists,、uh, Western biologists," he hastened to add, "seems to suggest very strongly that the root of a person's actions lies in his genetic makeup." That the murderer of twenty-four was a murderer in potential at two or three or four years old, or of course a mathematician or a musical genius. We are not discussing murderers," said Mrs. Drake. "My husband died as a result of an accident, an accident caused by a careless and badly adjusted personality. Whoever the boy or young man was, there is always the hope of eventual adjustment to a belief and acceptance that it is a duty to consider others." To be taught to feel an abhorrence if you have taken life unawares, simply out of what may be described as criminal carelessness, that was not really criminal in intent. You are quite sure, therefore, that it was not criminal in intent. I should doubt it very much. Mrs. Drake looked slightly surprised. I do not think that the police ever seriously considered that possibility. I certainly did not. It was an accident, a very tragic accident, which altered the pattern of many lives. Including my own. You say we are not discussing murderers," said Poirot. "But in the case of Joyce, that is just what we are discussing. 
There was no accident about that. Deliberate hands pushed that child's head down into water, holding her there till death occurred. Deliberate intent. I know. I know it's terrible. I don't like to think of it, to be reminded of it. She got up, moving about restlessly. Poirot pushed on relentlessly. We are still presented with a choice there. We still have to find the motive involved. It seems to me that such a crime must have been quite motiveless. You mean committed by someone mentally disturbed, to the extent of enjoying killing someone, presumably killing someone young and immature? One does hear of such cases. What is the original cause of them is difficult to find out. Even psychiatrists do not agree. You refuse to accept a simpler explanation. She looked puzzled. Simpler? Someone not mentally disturbed. Not a possible case for psychiatrists to disagree over. Somebody, perhaps, who just wanted to be safe. Safe? Oh, you mean the girl had boasted that same day, some hours previously, that she had seen someone commit a murder. Joyce, said Mrs. Drake, with calm certainty, was really a very silly little girl. Not, I am afraid, always very truthful. So everyone has told me said Hercule Poirot. I am beginning to believe, you know, that what everybody has told me might just be right. He added with a sigh, it usually is. He rose to his feet, adopting a different manner. I must apologize, madame. I have talked of painful things to you, things that do not truly concern me here. But it seemed from what Miss Whittaker told me, why don't you find out more from her? You mean... She is a teacher. She knows much better than I can what potentialities, as you have called them, exist amongst the children she teaches. She paused and then said, Miss Emlyn, too. The headmistress? Poirot looked surprised. Yes, she knows things. I mean, she is a natural psychologist. Uh, you said I might have ideas, half-formed ones, as to who killed Joyce. I haven't, but I think Miss Emlyn might. That is interesting. I don't mean has evidence. Uh, I mean, she just knows. She could tell you, uh, but I don't think she will. I begin to see, said Poirot, that I still have a long way to go. People know things, but they will not tell them to me. He looked thoughtfully at Rowena Drake. Your aunt, Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe, had an au pair girl who looked after her, a foreign girl. You seem to have got hold of all the local gossip. Rowena spoke dryly. Yes, that is so. She left here rather suddenly, soon after my aunt's death. For good reasons, it would seem. I don't know whether it's libel or slander to say so, but there seems no doubt that she forged a codicil to my aunt's will, or that someone helped her to do so. Someone? She was friendly with a young man who worked in a solicitor's office in Medchester. He had been mixed up in a forgery case before. The case never came to court because the girl disappeared. She realized the will would not be admitted to probate, and that there was going to be a court case. She left the neighborhood, and has never been heard of since. She too came. I have heard from a broken home, said Poirot. Rowena Drake looked at him sharply, but he was smiling amiably. Thank you for all you have told me, madame, he said. When Poirot had left the house, he went for a short walk along a turning off the main road, which was labelled Helpsley Cemetery Road. The cemetery in question did not take him long to reach. It was at most ten minutes' walk. It was obviously a cemetery that had been made in the last ten years, presumably to cope with the rising importance of Woodley as a residential entity. The church, a church of reasonable size, dating from some two or three centuries back, had had a very small enclosure round it already well filled. So the new cemetery had come into being with a footpath connecting it across two fields. It was, Poirot thought, a business-like modern cemetery with appropriate sentiments on marble or granite slabs. It had urns, chippings, small plantations of bushes or flowers. No interesting old epitaphs or inscriptions, nothing much for an antiquarian. Cleaned, neat, tidy, and with suitable sentiments expressed. He came to a halt to read a tablet erected on a grave contemporary with several others near it, all dating within two or three years back. It bore a simple inscription, 
sacred to the memory of Hugo Edmund Drake, beloved husband of Rowena Arabella Drake. He giveth his beloved sleep. It occurred to Poirot, fresh from the impact of the dynamic Rowena Drake, that perhaps sleep might have come in welcome guise to the late Mr. Drake. An alabaster urn had been fixed in position there, and contained the remains of flowers. An elderly gardener, obviously employed to tend the graves of good citizens departed this life, approached Poirot in the pleasurable hopes of a few minutes' conversation, while he laid his hoe and his broom aside. "'Stranger in these parts, I think,' he said. "'Aren't you, sir?' "'It is very true,' said Poirot. "'I am a stranger with you, as were my fathers before me.' "'Oh, well, uh, we've got that text somewhere, or somewhat very like it. "'Over down on the other corner it is,' he went on. "'He was a nice gentleman, he were, Mr. Drake. "'A cripple, you know. "'He had that infant paralysis, as they call it. "'Though as often as not, it is an infant to suffer from it. "'It's grown-ups. "'Men and women, too. "'My wife.' She had an aunt, who caught it in Spain, she did, went there with a tour, she did, and bathed somewhere in some river, and they said afterwards, as if it was some water infection. But I don't think they know much. Doctors don't, if you ask me. Still, it's made a lot of difference nowadays. All this inoculation they give the children and that, not nearly as many cases as there were. Yes, he were a nice gentleman. Didn't complain. Though he took it hard, being a cripple, I mean. He'd been a good sportsman he had in his time. Used to bat for us here in the village team. Many a six easy to the boundary. Yeah, he were a nice gentleman. He died of an accident, did he not? That's right. Crossing the road. Towards twilight, this was. One of these cars come along. Couple of these young thugs in it with beards growing up to their ears, that's what they say. Didn't stop either. Went on. Never looked to see. Abandoned the car somewhere in a car park twenty miles away. Wasn't their own car, either. Pinched from a car park somewhere. Oh, it's terrible. A lot of those accidents nowadays, and the police often can't do anything about them. Very devoted to him, his wife was. Took it very hard, she did. She comes here nearly every week. Brings flowers and puts them here. Yes, they were a very devoted couple. If you ask me, she won't stay here much longer. Really? But she has a very nice house here. Oh, yes. And she does a lot in the village, you know. All these things, you know, women's institutes and teas and various societies and all the rest of it. Runs a lot of things she does. Runs a bit too many for some people. Bossy, you know. Bossy and interfering, some people say. But the vicar relies on her. She starts things. Women's activities and all the rest of it. Gets up tours and outings. Ah, oh, yes. Often thought myself, though I wouldn't like to say to my wife, that all these good works as ladies does doesn't make you any fonder of the ladies themselves. Always know best they do. Always telling you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. No freedom. Not much freedom anywhere nowadays. You think uh, Mrs. Drake may leave here? Well, I shouldn't wonder if she didn't go away and live somewhere abroad. They like being abroad. Used to go there for holidays. Why do you think she wants to leave here? A sudden, rather roguish smile appeared on the old man's face. Well, I'd say, you know, that she's done all she can do here. To put it scriptural, she needs another vineyard to work in. She needs more good works. Aren't no more good works to be done round here. She's done all there is. And even more than there need be, so something, yes. She needs a new field in which to labour, suggested Poirot. You vid it. Better settle somewhere else where she can put a lot of things right and bully a lot of other people. She's got us where she wants us here, and there's not much more for her to do. It may be, said Poirot. Hasn't even got her husband to look after. She looked after him for a good few years. That gave her a kind of object in life, as you might say. What with that and a lot of outside activity, she could be busy all the time. She's the type likes being busy all the time. And she's no children, more's the pity. So it's my view, and she'll start all over again somewhere else. You may have something there. 
Where would she go? Oh, he couldn't say as to that. One of these rivierary places, maybe. Or there's them as goes to Spain or Portugal or Greece. I've heard her speak of Greece. Islands. Mrs. Butler, she's been to Greece on one of them tours. Hellenic, they call them, which sounds more like fire and brimstone to me. Poirot smiled. The Isles of Greece, he murmured. Then he asked, Do you like her? Mrs. Drake? Oh, I wouldn't say I exactly like her. She's a good woman. Does her duty to her neighbour and all that. But she'll always need a power and neighbours to do her duty to. And if you ask me, nobody really likes people who are always doing their duty. Tells me how to prune my roses, which I know well enough myself. Always at me to grow some new fangled kind of vegetable. Cabbage is good enough for me, and I'm sticking to cabbage. Poirot smiled. He said, I must be on my way. Can you tell me where Nicholas Ransom and Desmond Holland live? Past the church, third house on the left. They board with Mrs. Brand, going to Medchester Technical every day to study. They'll be home by now. He gave Poirot an interested glance. So, that's the way your mind's working, is it? There's some already as thinks the same. No, no, I think nothing as yet. But they were among those present. That is all. As he took leave and walked away, he mused, Among those present, I have come nearly to the end of my list. Two pairs of eyes looked at Poirot uneasily. I don't see what else we can tell you. We've both been interviewed by the police, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot looked from one boy to the other. They would not have described themselves as boys. Their manner was carefully adult, so much so that if one shut one's eyes, their conversation could have passed as that of elderly club men. Nicholas was eighteen. Desmond was sixteen. To oblige a friend, I make my inquiries of those present on a certain occasion, not the Halloween party itself, the preparations for that party. You were both active in these. Yes, we were. So far, Poirot said, I have interviewed cleaning women, I have had the benefit of police views, of talks to a doctor, the doctor who examined the body first, have talked to a school teacher who was present, to the headmistress of the school, to distraught relatives, have heard much of the village gossip. Uh, by the way, I understand that you have a local witch here. The two young men confronting him both laughed. <laughs> you mean Mother Goodbody? Yes, she came to the party and played the part of the witch. I have come now, said Poirot, to the younger generation, to those of acute eyesight and acute hearing, and who have up-to-date scientific knowledge and shrewd philosophy. I am eager, very eager, to hear your views on the matter. Eighteen and sixteen, he thought to himself, looking at the two boys confronting him, youths to the police, boys to him, adolescents to newspaper reporters, call them what you will, products of today. Neither of them, he judged, at all stupid, even if they were not quite of the high mentality that he had suggested to them by way of a flattering sop to start the conversation. They had been at the party. They had also been there earlier in the day to do helpful offices for Mrs. Drake. They had climbed up stepladders, they had placed yellow pumpkins in strategic positions, they had done a little electrical work on fairy lights, one or other of them had produced some clever effects in a nice batch of phony photographs of possible husbands, as imagined hopefully by teenage girls. They were also, incidentally, of the right age to be in the forefront of suspects in the mind of Inspector Raglan, and, it seemed, in the view of an elderly gardener. The percentage of murders committed by this group had been increasing in the last few years, not that Poirot inclined to that particular suspicion himself, but anything was possible. It was even possible that the killing which had occurred two or three years ago might have been committed by a boy, youth, or adolescent of fourteen or twelve years of age. Such cases had occurred in recent newspaper reports. Keeping all these possibilities in mind, he pushed them, as it were, behind a curtain for the moment, and concentrated instead on his own appraisement of these two, their looks, their clothes, their manner, their voices, and so on and so forth, in the Hercule Poirot manner, 
masked behind a foreign shield of flattering words and much increased foreign mannerisms, so that they themselves should feel agreeably contemptuous of him, though hiding that under politeness and good manners. For both of them had excellent manners. Nicholas, the eighteen-year-old, was good-looking, wearing sideburns, hair that grew fairly far down his neck, and a rather funereal outfit of black, not as a mourning for the recent tragedy, but what was obviously his personal taste in modern clothes. The younger one was wearing a rose-coloured velvet coat, mauve trousers, and a kind of frilled shirting. They both obviously spent a good deal of money on their clothes, which were certainly not purchased locally, and were probably paid for by themselves and not by their parents or guardians. Desmond's hair was ginger-coloured, and there was a good deal of fluffy profusion about it. You were there in the morning or afternoon of the party, I understand, helping with the preparations for it. Early afternoon, corrected Nicholas. What sort of preparations were you helping with? I have heard of preparation from several people, but I am not quite clear. They do not all agree. A good deal of lighting, for one thing. Getting up on steps for things that had to be put high up. I understand there were some very good photographic results, too. Desmond immediately dipped into his pocket and took out a folder from which he proudly brought certain cards. "'We faked up these beforehand,' he said. "'Husbands for the girls,' he explained. "'They're all alike, birds are. They all want something up to date. Not a bad assortment, are they?' He handed a few specimens to Poirot, who looked with interest at a rather fuzzy reproduction of a ginger-bearded young man and another young man with an aureole of hair, a third one whose hair came to his knees almost— and there were a few assorted whiskers and other facial adornments. Made him pretty well all different. <laughs> Wasn't bad, was it? You had models, I suppose? Oh, they're all ourselves. Just makeup, you know. Nick and I got them done. Some Nick took of me and some I took of him. Just varied what you might call the hair motif. Very clever, said Poirot. We kept them a bit out of focus, you know, so that they look more like spirit pictures, as you might say. The other boy said, Mrs. Drake was very pleased with them. She congratulated us. They made her laugh, too. It was mostly electrical work we did at the house, you know, fitting up a light or two so that when the girls sat with the mirror, one or other of us could take up a position. You'd only to bob up over a screen, and the girl would see a face in the mirror with, mind you, the right kind of hair, beard or whiskers or something or other. Did they know it was you and your friend? Oh, I don't think so for a moment. Not at the party, they didn't. They knew we had been helping at the house with some things, but I don't think they recognized us in the mirrors. Weren't smart enough, I should say. Besides, we'd got sort of an instant make-up to change the image. First me, then Nicholas. The girls squeaked and shrieked. Damn funny! And the people who were there in the afternoon? I do not ask you to remember who was at the party. At the party? There must have been about thirty, I suppose, knocking about— in the afternoon there was Mrs. Drake, of course, Mrs. Butler, one of the school teachers, um, Whitaker, I think her name is, Mrs. Flatterbutt or something like that. She's the organist's sister or wife. Dr. Ferguson's dispenser, Miss Lee, it's her afternoon off, and she came along and helped too. And some of the kids came to make themselves useful if they could. Not that I think they were very useful. The girls just hung about and giggled. Ah, yes. Do you remember what girls were there? Well, uh... The Reynolds were there, poor old Joyce, of course, the one who got done in, and her sister Anne, frightful girl, puts no end of side on, thinks she's terribly clever, quite sure she's going to pass all her A-levels. And the small kid, Leopold, he's awful, said Desmond. He's a sneak. He eavesdrops, tells tales, real nasty bit of goods. And there was Beatrice Ardley and Cathy Grant, who is as dim as they make, and a couple of useful women, of course, uh, cleaning women, I mean, and the authoress woman, the one who brought you down here. Any men? Oh, uh, the vicar looked in, if you count him. Nice old boy, rather dim. And the new curate, he stammers when he's nervous, hasn't been here long. That's all I can think of now. And then I understand you heard this girl, Joyce Reynolds, saying something about having seen a murder committed. I never heard that, said Desmond. Did she? "'Oh, they're saying so,' said Nicholas. "'I didn't hear her. 
I suppose I wasn't in the room when she said it. Where was she? When she said that, I mean. In the drawing room. Yes, well, most of the people were in there, unless they were doing something special. Of course, Nick and I, said Desmond, were mostly in the room where the girls were going to look for their true loves in mirrors, fixing up wires and various things like that, or else we were out on the stairs fixing fairy lights. We were in the drawing room once or twice, putting the pumpkins up and hanging up one or two that had been hollowed out to hold lights in them. But I didn't hear anything of that kind when we were in there. What about you, Nick? I didn't, said Nick. He added with some interest. Did Joyce really say she'd seen a murder committed? Jolly interesting, you know, if she did, isn't it? Oh, why is it so interesting? asked Desmond. Well, it's ESP, isn't it? I mean, there you are. She saw a murder committed, and within an hour or two she herself was murdered. I suppose she had a sort of vision of it. Makes you think a bit. You know, these last experiments they've been having, seems as though there is something you can do to help it by getting an electrode or something of that kind fixed up to your jugular vein. I've read about it somewhere. Oh, they've never got very far with this ESP stuff, said Desmond scornfully. People sit in different rooms, looking at cards in a pack or words with squares and geometrical figures on them, but they never see the right things, or hardly ever. Well, you've got to be pretty young to do it. Adolescents are much better than older people. Hercule Poirot, who had no wish to listen to this high-level scientific discussion, broke in. As far as you can remember, nothing occurred during your presence in the house which seemed to you sinister or significant in any way, something which probably nobody else would have noticed, but which might have come to your attention. Nicholas and Desmond frowned hard, obviously racking their brains to produce some incident of importance. No! It was just a lot of clacking and arranging and doing things. Have you any theories yourself? Poirot addressed himself to Nicholas. What, uh, theories as to who did Joyce in? Yes, I mean, something that you might have noticed that could lead you to a suspicion on uh, perhaps purely psychological grounds. Yes, I can see what you mean. There might be something in that. Whittaker, for my money, said Desmond, breaking into Nicholas's absorption in thought. "'The schoolmistress?' asked Poirot. "'Yes, real old spinster, you know, sex-starved, and all that teaching, bottled up among a lot of women. You remember, one of the teachers got strangled a year or two ago. She was a bit queer, they say.' "'Lesbian?' asked Nicholas, in a man-of-the-world voice. "'I shouldn't wonder. Do you remember Nora Ambrose, the girl she lived with? She wasn't a bad looker. She had a boyfriend or two, so they said, and the girl she lived with got mad with her about it.' Someone said she was an unmarried mother. She was away for two terms with some illness and then came back. They'd say anything in this nest of gossip. Well, anyway, Whittaker was in the drawing room most of the morning. She probably heard what Joyce said. Might have put it into her head, mightn't it? Look here, said Nicholas. Supposing Whittaker, what age is she? Do you think forty-odd? Getting on for fifty? Women do go a bit queer at that age. They both looked at Poirot with the air of contented dogs who have retrieved something useful which Master has asked for. I bet Miss Emlyn knows if it is so. There's not much she doesn't know about what goes on in her school. Or wouldn't she say? Perhaps she feels she has to be loyal and shield her. Oh, I don't think she'd do that. If she thought Elizabeth Whittaker was going off her head, well then, I mean, a lot of the pupils at the school might get done in. What about the curate? said Desmond hopefully. He might be a bit off his nut. You know— Original sin, perhaps, and all that. And the water, and the apples, and the things, and, and then... Look here, I've got a good idea now. Suppose he is a bit balmy. Not been here very long. Nobody knows much about him. Supposing it's the snapdragon put it into his head. Hellfire. All those flames going up. Then, you see, he took hold of Joyce, and he said, Come along with me, and I'll show you something. And he took her to the apple room, and he said, Kneel down. He said, This is baptism and pushed her head in. See? It would all fit. Adam and Eve and the apple, and hellfire, and the snapdragon, and being baptized again to cure you of sin. Perhaps he exposed himself to her first, said Nicholas, hopefully. I mean, there's always got to be a sex background to all these things. They both looked with satisfied faces to Poirot. Well, said Poirot, you've certainly given me something to think about.
End of disc four.